Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. You are on the mental health panel with yours truly, Pastor Hosea, my lovely wife, First Lady Doran Collins, and we are excited about this panel. I've got some great special guests we're going to be bringing in here momentarily on the screens. Yes. So this is time for you to tell everybody you know. Text them, tell them to log on to our Facebook or our YouTube or any of those platforms right now at CBC Hawthorne. You can find us there at CBC Hawthorne, and we're going to talk about some very, very important things. Remember, we're on the 21-day holistic fast and consecration, that spirit, soul, and body, because in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, he says, I pray that God will sanctify you holy. God sanctifies holy, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're focusing on. So everybody joining in, I'm going to bring our guest up in just a moment. Let everybody know, text your friends, families, loved ones. Praise God. God bless you, Burko, Burko. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Kiara, God bless you. Let me turn it on my personal page as well. Thought about that. I'm going to go to my personal Facebook page. I don't want to miss nobody's comments. You might have questions and the like. Want to be able to get all of that. Praise God. Bless you. Bless wow. you, Kenny. What's good? Faith. Uh, we're going to get on here. I'm going to bring up my our special guest in a moment. And we're going to discuss some very, very important issues as it relates to mental health. We're going to, we got to deal with the stigma we've had in our communities for way too long, way too long. Amen. I'll oh, thank you, Sister Burko. Bless you. Say, I guess our first time seeing you, baby. Say, I got a beautiful oh, okay. wife. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Let's see. Let's get everybody on. All right. I'm going to go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer. And we're going to get ready to get started from there. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for allowing us to have this time together. Yes. We thank you, Lord God, for blessing us to have this panel discussion yes. that we're going to attack mental health, Lord God, and deal with it, yes. Father God, from a biblical perspective and a very practical perspective, Lord God, that we're never to be so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. Yes. So help us to give to receive clarity, comprehension, understanding. Bless all of our panelists on this morning, oh God, and or this afternoon, rather, yes, that they would be used by you to help yes. shed light and yes. understanding on this subject as we see this being the first of many. So, Father God, bless us, for you said in your word, you wish above all things that we prosper and be in health yes. even as our soul prosper. Yes. We know that our soul is our mind, I will and our emotions. Yes. So let us prosper in the soulish realm, in the mental realm, yes. so that we may prosper physically and 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 and, and spiritually yes. as well. In Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 Mm -hmm. So praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Bless you, everybody that's joined us today. We're excited. At this time, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and we're going to bring them on, and we're going to deal with things from a mental health perspective. Yes. Amen. The first introduction, I'm grateful and <laughs> glad and excited. Well, you know what? Let me start with our first introduction being to my lovely wife. I mm -hmm. thank God she hails all the way from the country of Belize in <laughs> Central America. She's been in the States now for, well, uh, 20 years at least. And she's been educated here in the States. She's went on to come to the States and started, amen, by completing. I'm just so proud of this woman. She got here. She didn't even have her GED. She got her GED. She went on to community college and got an associate's degree. She went on to get her bachelor's degree. And right now, on in February next month, she will officially have, have, have received her master's degree as a MFT, marriage and family therapist. I'm excited. 
She's already in her practicum, getting her hours. She's seeing clients every day. So mental health and just dealing with people is nothing she's new to. She have just as many counseling appointments as I do. Trust me, that's a lot to keep up with me. <laughs> but I'm excited. So welcome, Doran Collins. Thank you, thank you. So, Anything you want to say before I bring in the next panelist? Uh, we could go ahead because we have time. Okay, okay. Bring she said she's going to save her comments. <laughs> All right, praise God. So next up to bat, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. This next young lady, I haven't been knowing for a very long time, but I, we have a mutual friend that we're very, very close to, and she has spoken so highly of her. I'm so excited to have her on. The one and only sister Camille Hollis, praise Ooh. God, formerly known as Camille Henderson, <laughs> but she's been married now for a year. Congrats yes. to her. She's a license. She's already a license. Ooh. Yeah. marriage and family therapist. She enjoys working with children, teens, and adults who experience depression, anxiety, psychosis, crisis. She's dealt with it all. She's very passionate for seeing believers experience emotional healing and freedom through this therapeutic techniques and in God's word, most importantly. She speaks at facilities. She's well known. She's well sought after. Uh, she speaks, she facilitates mental wellness workshops. She she does it at churches too. So if you're a pastor yes. or a church leader, you want to bring her in. And she just enjoys spreading God's messages Amen. about how Christians must intentionally focus on our mental health, right. our mental state. Because out of it flows the issues of life. I'm a current believer of that. Amen. I agree with her 100% according to Proverbs 4 and 23. So with no further ado, we want to bring up on the stage Woo! at this time, the one and only yes. Mrs. Camille. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Yes. So thank you for having me. God bless you guys. <laughs> okay. And last but certainly not least, someone that I have known personally for a very long time. I am so grateful. Uh, just it's been a joy. For, for her to be in my life. when you, The greatest gift you'll ever receive from God are not materialistic. Right. The greatest gift you ever receive from God are meaningful relationships yes, yes. that impact your life and enhance it and make you much better than you were before you came into contact with them. Amen. And she's one of those gifts. I've called upon her for many, many, many <laughs> things, and she's never let me down. Amen. And she's very dependable. She's also very intellectually astute. She's a brainiac. And she is the one and only attorney who works in Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office as yes. a deputy public defender and none other than attorney yes. Cheryl Woo. Bailey yes. Esquire. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm grateful, I'm excited, and I don't want to waste no time. I want to dive right in. I think I want to start with you, Mrs. Hollis, as it relates to mental health and all of the people that you see. It seems that there's a big stigma, a negative stigma about mental health, especially, unfortunately, in the black community. Like, we tend to shy away from it. Like, I'm not crazy, and we have this, this illusion of it as being as something dreadfully bad is wrong with us and and i don't know i just want to hear your thoughts on that with the people you see and, and kind of speak on that for us yeah um definitely there there is a lot of stigma within the black community i think for a long time therapy or even mental health uh related issues that seem more like a white people thing you know and i think that you know because of the historic things that black people our culture our community has went through um it's caused us to you know be tough to be you know to hide to in order to make it not show your truest self so sometimes i think just the idea or the thought of i have to go somewhere and be vulnerable i have to go somewhere yeah and and bear all it's kind of counter counterintuitive of what maybe a lot of us have been socialized around right. a lot of us who have been, uh, grew up in the hood and urban communities that's right. not what you do 
if you're trying to make it, if you're trying to uh, basically survive, a lot of us have uh, grown up or were born in a lot of places where we had to develop a lot of survival coping skills to make it. And so the essence of that, a lot of times will cause people to be like, "Mm, you know, I'm good. I'm all right. I'm making it. Mm -hmm. And then also too, uh, within our culture, a lot of times there's a mistrust against the medical field. And I think if you're going to therapy and the person doesn't look like you, or they don't share the same culture as you, it's like, how do you understand? How do you really understand what I'm experiencing and what I'm, I'm going through? So that's why I'm happy for what you guys are doing to kind of show it in a different light and show it how it could be applicable in in all races. That's good. That's good. Very good. Well said. You know, as I'm uh, um, addressing Sister Cheryl, Attorney Cheryl Bailey, yes. I think it's important that uh, uh, that they know she's not just on this panel today as an expert on mental health. She's actually on this panel as a patient, as a client, mm-hmm. as one that 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 receives therapy on a weekly basis. And I think on the outside looking in, Cheryl, I want you to kind of speak to this. People will look at, but wait a minute, you're young, you're black, you're you're educated, you're an attorney, you got it going on, you making money, you got a good paying job, like you independent, you I N D E P E when you get <laughs> Like, I mean, you, you're all of that. Like, why would someone as successful as you need to sit down with a therapist? Like, what is that about? I used to have the same thought. Like, I used to think everything is fine. Like, uh, Camille said, um, you just learn to just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. But something was always wrong. Like, even though nothing was going on wrong in my life, it was still hard for me to get out of bed. It was still hard for me to go through my caseload without feeling exhausted. It was still very hard for me to have conversations. And I often said, um, I always feel like I'm drowning in plain sight. But everybody was like, oh, but she's good. She can swim, Hmm. but I'm drowning. And when you're strong and people perceive you as being strong, Mm-hmm. Um, there you don't feel vulnerable. Like there's no place for you to say this is how I'm really feeling. Number one, I didn't know how I was feeling. I was raised that you know, you work, you do well, you 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 help people, you just keep pushing. If you your your back hurt, walk it off. You know, um, so that's what I've been doing my entire life. I just been walking things off. Best friend died, walk it off. Mm-hmm. You know, people. Your grandmother dies, you walk it off. You know, you get hit by a car, you walk it off. You just walk it off. You walk it off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you become a culture, and it's everything else seems like weakness. Wow. But eventually, it catches up to you when you don't understand your emotions and you don't understand how you live your life. It catches up to me, and it caught up to me in 2014. In oh. 2014, one of my coworkers came into my office, and she just looked at me, and she said, you are done. She just looked me in the face and she said, you're done. And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, you're done. I can tell you the way you walk, the way you talk, everything about you has changed. I went to the doctor that same day because I made an emergency appointment. My blood pressure was 151 over 101. And he said, you're done. I'm taking you off work. And I didn't know what to do with that. And he was like, you have to go to therapy and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And when I went to therapy, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder and anxiety. Wow. started to make sense once they started teaching me what those things were. I've been doing it my entire life. I've Mm. just been walking it off. Mm. And so, yes, people, they come to me, they ask me questions. I'm always willing to help and do whatever. But at the same time, I forgot who I was. Mm. So my whole identity became based on what I can do for other people. And so I didn't know how to take care of myself. Mm. And because we never talk about emotions or mental illness or mental health, um, I'm like, you know, I tell people all the time, well, I'm crazy, but I'm not really crazy. I'm a human being living an experience and having emotions. I just don't know how to properly deal with those emotions. And two, I realize it's not all situational. Like some people have situational depression. 
it's actually chemicals in my brain that don't develop as well. And I don't know all the sciencey parts, maybe Camille could talk about that, is that there's a chemical reaction. So a lot of times I feel like we don't seek help because I go to church and they tell me to pray. Right. And they say, well, if I can't pray it often, I must not be holy enough. <laughs> or they tell me don't have a pity party. Come I have on. nothing to pity, but sometimes the hardest fight for me is waking up and getting myself out of bed in the morning. Wow. That's wow. the success of the day. Wow. So and it's hard when you're carrying all of that and then people just look at you and they're like, oh, you have nothing to complain about. Your life is perfect. And it's not. Nobody's life is perfect. But there's also an extra thing in my brain that makes it so if I make a little mistake, that must, I can wake up and think about something that I did when I was eight. And was like, why did I do wow. that? Wow. And a lot of people's brains, they don't do that. They're able to just move forward. But my brain will conk up something that happened in 2012 and be like, remember that party? And you said this, why did you say it like that? And I wonder how that other person, and then you want to call the other person. And you're just like, right. that's not normal, but that's how I was living. Yeah. And it took somebody to look at me and say, something is wrong. Yeah. And sometimes we don't do that for each other because we don't know, we don't have these conversations, but we don't know how to see when something is wrong with somebody else as well. Wow, Sister so, Camille, can you speak to that with the, especially the, chemical part she was speaking of. I think we're, a lot of us are ignorant mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, well, uh, she started off by saying situational depression. So I first wanted to start with that. So that could be okay. anything that's within your environment. That could be something internal. That could be um, cognitive. So I mean, the way you're perceiving a situation can cause depression in the life. So that's what situational depression is. When it's something that um, usually I liken it to cognitive, meaning th with your thinking process, yeah. the way you're interpreting that situation situation or sometimes we go through things and the situation is really just messed up and we're it you know fighting you know fighting to keep our joy and things like that but what she's right. talking about is biological depression so what that is is in all of our brains, our brains makes a certain amount of like dopamine, a certain amount of serotonin. And so a lot of times there could be a couple of things that can cause biological depression. So our gut and our brain are connected through the vagus nerve, just a little science-y, but it's connected through the vagus nerve. 80% of serotonin, when it, that is a mood chemical. That's what kind of determines, you know, if we're feeling good or we're feeling present is created within in our gut. So now what studies are showing is that there could be in the brain, there could be a struggle with creating those uh, neur neurons or dopamine chemicals or within our gut, we could have low acidity within wow. our stomach. There could be a gut imbalance or a hormonal imbalance that's causing the depression. So, yeah, I'm so glad when you guys say we're looking at mental health or getting ourselves together holistically because we're tripart beings. We're body, mind, spirit, and soul. And so a lot of times, yeah, when we go to sit down to treat depression, we must first rule out the medical just to make sure that it's not a physical condition causing the, the mental health impact. So how do how would I rule out the medical? Would it be as simple as going to the doctor or do I need a psychiatrist? How do I rule out that it's not medical before I attack the other areas? Yeah, good question. So you can go to the doctor, they can uh, run like blood tests, they can check a person's thyroid and make sure it's not the thyroid that uh, is malfunctioning. Also too, I always tell people like if you've tried a lot of things or you've been in therapy for a significant time and you haven't ruled out the medical, then that's a good, especially okay. good time to do it. I also push holistic doctors too as well, just because, you know, with Big Pharma, they they get influence within mainstream doctors that right. it's kind of convoluted sometimes. So even a holistic doctor would even be able to go further to determine if your hormonal balances are off too as well. Wow, that's good. <laughs> That my doctor found was that one of the things that my doctor found is that I was very deficient in vitamin D, um, which also oh, wow. caused depression. Um, and it's very interesting what you said about the gut because 
when I lack serotonin or whatever chemical I lack sometimes, I notice, you know, you just, I start eating more. Okay. Like it's just mindless because the food gives you, can mm-hmm. give you some of those chemicals. Yeah. yeah. That's what you crave because you're waiting, you're, you want that high. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's yeah. how like, food for me, I know is an addiction in the sense of I use it to comfort whenever I'm having those low periods. It's like a hug. Yeah. Wow. It gives me the chemicals that I'm missing in my brain as well. Well, not mm-hmm. missing, but you know, but that's right. for me. Yeah. In my brain as well. That's a yeah. good point. Good point. What would you say? Um, one thing that she mentioned was, you know, you said you'd wake up in the morning and sometimes you would think about the past when you were like eight years old. A lot of times, like in cultures, we, as you mentioned before, we don't talk about stuff or voice as a child. We, we are not supposed to be heard. We're just supposed to be shut up and, and don't say anything. But, and then we, we carry this on up until, you know, adult. And so there's a lot of things that triggers that we have to deal with, that we have to learn to cope with each day. And some people, like you said yourself, some people turn to food. Some, and especially we see this in men, a lot of men, they're told to be tough that, you know, and they carry this from generation onto generation thinking that it's not okay to cry or not okay to so- show emotions. And then we wonder why mentally they turn to alcohol or drugs to cope. And we also see this in vets. So it, it, for men, it's hard for them to actually express themselves. And that's why I'm happy that we're doing this because there's a lot of men out there that need to know that it's okay to have a voice, to talk to someone. And um, I know that there's a lot of cultures that come to us um, each day and it's good to study about them and, and learn and listen and learn. Cause listening is one thing that I had struggled with up until when I started my internship, just to sit down and so much that we could learn from them. But um, you know, the coping is something that have to put in effort and do it on purpose. Um, as you know, as we go along each day, it's going to be a struggle, but it takes uh, effort. That's good. Really quick. Let me let the audience know this. This is good. I want you to know that I'm streaming in with us. You can ask questions through the comments mm-hmm. and I'm checking the comments because yeah. if you have a question, I would definitely pose it to our panelists. So anything specific that's on your mind, Please let release it in the comments and we'll we'll try to address it. Okay, I think was were you about to weigh in on that, Sister Camille? Yeah, I was going to say too a couple of things. Well, even like you talk about culture, even in black culture, you know, I grew up saying you don't tell family business. And, uh-huh. and if you did, you got in trouble. So I think even what the ladies were saying is kind of even inherent within our culture. Like you just keep going. You don't you don't tell your business right. to everybody. You know, you just kind of. And then also, like Cheryl touched on it, a lot of uh, in our black communities, well, a lot of us are people of faith. Mm-hmm. So there's that thread of faith. And then it's how do I how what part determining what parts I go to God. And what part do I seek man-made help? And I think that there's this still like unclear line of what that looks like. What does that mean if I end up going to a therapist? What what does that say about my faith? What does that say about who I am? And also, too, I was going to say when she mentioned talking about men, it's also sometimes that's why men turn to porn. It's not necessarily just because of like a sexual addiction, but also, too, that like when Cheryl, you talk about that high, that 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 experience that you get from seeing visually being stimulated. Also, too, that is another form of how men are dealing with the internal internal issues that are going on. Wow. I think the thing that Dora said that um, about culture is so important because even within the black community, there's a lot of different cultures. Like, you know, she's from Belize, my family's Panamanian, you know, uh, Camille, your family's from the West Coast, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's all different. And Paso Zay, you're from Louisiana. It's Mm -hmm. all all totally different cultures. And we were trained similarly, but differently Mm -hmm. based on our situation. And I think that a lot of times what we all have in common is how we train our children to mm. and withhold information, mm. which is why a lot of things run rapid through the black community because we, there is a, because due to slavery, we have trained ourselves to protect True. our yep. children. And the way you protect your children 
is make sure that nobody sees them because the, it culturally it was a death sentence if your child said the wrong thing in public. Yeah. And we continue that tradition to the point where we don't treat our children as human beings. Wow. Right? Your kids, they're wow. not human beings. So when things happen to them, like just wow. even this pandemic, our, our adults, we're having all these emotions, but are we checking in with our kids? We still expect our kids to act regular, to do their wow. homework, be on school and That's do all those things, but we're not checking in with them as a human being. Yeah. And when they do express bad behavior, we do physical punishment instead of emotional inquisition. Wow. In so I think we also, I'm, this is what I'm learning at 42. Uh -huh. I'm learning how to identify emotions. I used to tell people I only have two emotions. I'm either happy or mad. Don't get me mad. <laughs> right? And now when somebody says, well, how do you feel about that? I'm stuck. Like, wait, what, what feelings? I'm not happy and I'm not mad, but I don't know what this is. And that's because as a kid, nobody ever asks you, how do you really feel? You don't have that space because you're not, you just do what I say. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's when you have a question, we need to start ask. we need to stop asking for facts and ask for feelings. Right. That's good. So when you say to your kid, well, what happened? And they're like, well, he did this and he did that. And you're just concerned about the facts. So when he did this, how did that make you feel? I love and it. If you felt that way, why, what did that make you do? And so the hardest thing in my life is connecting my emotions and how I'm feeling with what mm -hmm. I did with those emotions. So mm -hmm. now I have to learn how to trace when I was feeling sad, what was my response to that sadness? Mm -hmm. Usually my response is not to respond. I avoid it. Yeah. Uh -huh. These things I've learned through now four or five years of therapy. And I've had a lot of different therapists because the one thing is that what I've learned is that there's a therapy for each season. Wow. And so as I grow into a different season, I need a different therapist to work on different issues. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, 42 years of ignoring my mental health. So now I have to put in that work to, to be, I don't know. No, this, this is excellent. I got a couple of questions uh, uh, that came in. One is, uh, how does one find a therapist of color? Oh, that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I think especially since 2021, all the craziness that happens, I've been seeing a lot of uh, organizations come together to help with that. The one basic one is uh, my. It's called Minority Psychology Network. That's okay. a black organization where they black therapists are listed. Uh, there's one that's called the. Um, Ooh, healing. I, I can get a list together for you guys after and, you know, send it. But, you know, even if you just, there's a, even Taja Henson, the actor, she has a whole now organization. She has uh, birthed out. And I think she's even helping people get free therapy uh, wow. for, within the, the Black community. So, yeah, if you just uh, research, you know, People have come. There's so many organizations now because of 2020 that in all the racial stuff that had broke out too, that they're um, it's very very accessible. But um, I can definitely get a list together after and just email uh, you guys, and you can give it to your uh, congregation too. That's not a problem. That's good. Wonderful, wonderful. Here is a. I don't know if this would be a question. <laughs> well, it is a question because it asks twice. I deal with depression, maybe because I'm still single, and I pray this year will be the year. Should I just move on and be free? So I, I think sometimes that we connect depression to circumstances, and it's because we think circumstances would change how we feel. Well, often it's deeper. I want to share a truth right here. Uh, I've been counseling for almost 20 years just as a pastor. For the first time in my life, I found myself in therapy two years ago. Now, there's a reason I'm bringing this up to address this question. 
because I thought the reason I can't function and mentally my health is horrible, I thought it was because I lost my wife. And of course, duh, naturally, I went through, you know, a, a secret depression and just lost my fuel for living. But what was interesting in therapy, I found out my real problem wasn't just connected to the loss of my wife, mm. that it was embedded and things in my childhood mm -hmm. that actually my wife was such a force it was somewhat temporarily covered mm -hmm. i didn't have to address it or deal with it so the removal of her mm -hmm. exposed all this crap that i hadn't dealt with in 20 years mm -hmm. and so to my man and saying, well i think i'm depressed because i'm single mm -hmm. it's probably deeper <laughs> it's probably deeper and that's why you should seek out some type of, 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 of mental health health assistance whether that be therapy counseling or whatever to help you discover that my brother and I see one other question uh, what do you do if you have a family member who is struggling with mental illness mm -hmm. but has yet to be diagnosed and refuses to seek help that that is a very super super hard one um i guess the first thing i would kind of want to know is that person's relation to that family member uh because it's very different if it's a spouse it's very different if it's a child, it's very different if it's an adult child, or it's like, it's my sister who I don't live with. All of those things kind of play a part in how um, you will go about in doing that. I think if someone is definitely persistent in not, um, in not going to seek help, you know, you can't make them, like we can't make people go in. As, as much as we want to, to do that. But I would also encourage that person. So what I do for people who maybe they're dealing with someone who is, you know, has mental illness or is sus suspected that they do is for you to seek help for yourself. Because a lot of times um, there are tools, there are family support groups right, right. that support family members to wow. someone with that individual that can help give you tips specifically on whatever it is that you're encountering. That's, that's good. good. Yeah, that's good. That is a good point. And also, I mean, judgment, like accusing somebody of being mentally ill, like saying, you sound like a schizophrenic, you sound like you have bipolar, you. You, you look like you're depressed and putting things on them. I think the modeling of behavior is a much better approach. Letting the person know also that you're open to talks about mental health that are not in judgment. So when you talk about, like, I talk about my mental health all the time. Just yeah. it's in front of my niece and her friends. Like, you know, I'm not having a very good mental health day. So today, this is what I'm going to do for my mental health. I'm going to cook for myself today. I'm mm -hmm. going to do this today. And then so they can see that it's okay to talk about. Right. That's good. That can lead to a dialogue that's going to be more fruitful and more. Um, that's good. And that's good. walk somebody into saying, okay, maybe I do need to talk to somebody. Because now I'm not telling them that they're ill. And I think using the word illness makes it work. Ah. It's mm -hmm. mental health. It's like if you said you need to exercise because you're ill. That doesn't make it fun. But you have to your health. Yeah. And it's right. with your mind. Your mind is a muscle or brain, whatever. Right. I don't know biology. I'm not going to try. But right. whatever it is, it can grow, it can heal, it can be damaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you need to work on the healthy part and how to make it help. And it's not always medication, it's little things like, you know, taking a walk. My therapist wants me to walk an hour a day. Okay. Um, you know, writing down gratitude every day. Certain mm -hmm. things start to change your perspective 
yeah. and to really try to figure out what's going on. So there's so many levels of mental health. Mm. Oh, I need medication, and I'm on medication yeah. because with the, the thing in my brain, it helps me to focus. And when I do, I do well. And then just like any person who deals with mental health or any type of health, I backslide. I don't work out. I don't do the things I'm supposed to. And then I wake up two weeks and I'll be like, I can't go on. There's nothing I can do. I hate my life. Pastor Isaiah, come save me. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's because I stopped doing the simple things to take care of myself. That's and good. I think one of the things that I've been talking to Pastor Isaiah about my, and to my therapist about is um, sometimes you, you, you're comfortable in your mental illness. Sometimes yeah. in your mental, your mental mind state, because it, it becomes who you are. You're known as this person mm -hmm. and you're, you know, you don't want to change your perspective, your own perspective of yourself. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what it's like not to have it. Mm -hmm. So there's some kind of security in mental illness. And when Pastor Hosea said the other day in um, Bible study, our morning devotional, he touched on it a little bit. Uh, with the man at the pool of Bethesda, do you even want to be healed? Yeah. So I think sometimes, and that's been on my heart for a long time because it's a that's the battle. Mm -hmm. It's like we always talk about choose life or death. You know, you have a choice between life and death. Choose life, but what if I'm choosing death every day? Mm -hmm. I'm choosing death by smoking. I'm choosing death by drinking. I'm choosing. Right. Death much. I'm choosing death all the time. So right. when you say, "Do you want to be healed?" It's like number one, I don't even know I'm sick. Mm -hmm. I don't know I'm dying. Right. But if I didn't know, am I so comfortable? Right. Is that just who I am? I've been saying that for years. Oh, girl, that's just who I am. I get a little crazy sometimes, but that's fine. I, I come back. That's just who I am. That's just who I am. That's just who I am. And then I pray to God, God, can you please save me? But <laughs> you're saying who you are. Yeah. So, the, I mean, to me, that's a, a very important part of mental illness is recognizing that there is something that you need to work on yeah. and then really deciding that that's that you want to be healed right right and i'm not just talking about supernaturally i'm talking about you know in the pool of bethesda it was immediately but mine right. is a journey like it's not right. i have to choose to want to be healed every day hey cheryl what's what's interesting about the passage of scripture you bring up because you're right jesus asked him do you even want to be healed mm -hmm. but the man was at the pool mm -hmm. <laughs> he was at the place that you go to be healed hmm. but Jesus still saw it necessary mm -hmm. to ask him do you want because sometimes we can't go through the motions mm -hmm. That's true. but still you're hanging on to comfortable I, 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 well I credit myself for coining this crazy sounding contradictive phrase mm -hmm. I call it being uncomfortably comfortable mm. because it's not really comfortable, but pain is predictable. Mm. And I'm so accustomed to it, not that I enjoy it, but I know how to do this. Mm. I've learned how to live in this space. So while I may somewhat pray to get out of it, I never really try to get out of it mm. because it's a part of it that is comfortable just because it's familiar mm. and I think a lot of us go there which which one of the, the questions that I wanted to bring up I think is a big one to deal with the stigma how do we define mental health mm. What is when we talk about people about mental health and oh mental health ain't nothing wrong with me. So what is an accurate way that maybe we can change in our culture of how we define that term? Mm -hmm. What is that practically speaking? And we can all weigh in on that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is different. I, I believe that every because health is wholeness, and mm -hmm. what you define as as wholeness. Okay. I might not define as wholeness because we all deal with with issues and, and experiences different. So for me, with mental health, a lot of people, well, let me talk about some of my clients. I'm not going to call name, of course. Um, I asked this question and most of them said, well, for me, mental health is me 
eating healthy or another another person would be like i would exercise or so everybody have different issues and different coping mechanism the way that they deal with things like um cheryl just mentioned you know she have like walking you know they encourage her to walk and when you don't walk you feel like wow man i should have walked but there's different things that we you know we um we experience and we you know label as mental health um i don't know if miss uh what is her name? Yeah. Oh, this name is Kim. <laughs> say, say, say Miss Hollis. Miss Hollis. Okay. <laughs> no, I, 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 that, that was powerful what you guys are saying. I think also too, um, as good we are defining it because I think just not even in the black culture, but just in culture in general, mm -hmm. uh, there there is misconception about the term mental health. Yeah. Uh, usually is interchange with um, like a clinical diagnosis or a mental a mental illness they usually use it interchangeably and it's actually not mental health it's just like it's just as we can apply it to physical health when we say uh, well, how's your physical health well mental health is what is your emotional and mental state what kind of state is it in? Now, when we talk about being clinically diagnosed with something or clinically um, labeled with something, then we're talking about someone who is experiencing a mental challenge or a mental obstacle in their mental health. That That's, good. Yeah. That's good. So I hear you. We often use them interchangeably when right. we really shouldn't. That's right. where the confusion comes in. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Uh, someone answered the question to the one that asked, so I want to give you this answer. The one that asked, uh, what do you do if you have a family member who is struggling with mental illness but has yet to be diagnosed and refuses to seek help? We have an answer for someone else who works in the mental health, uh, the mental health field. They right. said, you can inquire about a mental health warrant if they feel like they might be a threat to themselves or mm -hmm. someone else mm -hmm. to help with, and this can help with getting them engaged in receiving mm -hmm. help. So I've never heard of that, a mental mm -hmm. health warrant. That's mm -hmm. something different to yeah. that uh, listener. You might want to seek that. I think that's different in every state and county. Oh. Every state has that situation. Okay. This person is in California that said that, so it's good you brought it out. Yeah, so I would, um, there's also pet teams that you can call. Um, you can call to one and get information for like a pet team. But these are like highly escalated situations where people are in uh, either mania or psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I try to tell people unless it's absolutely necessary, do not call the police because they're not trained in mental health. Um, and the situation usually escalates and then they have to come see me at my job. Um, but you can try to, if they are in a heightened state, um, contact a pet team, call 211 to get information about uh, a pet team. If it's really bad, you can call 911 and let them know that it's a mental health situation. Um, but in order to actually get a warrant for them to actually go into a mental health facility, that's going to be a little bit more difficult in California. Okay. So that varies from state to state. That's good to yeah. know. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Someone asked, how does one know when to seek pastoral counseling versus medical counseling? When your pastor can't help you, go seek medical <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I do both. I see Pastor Zan on a, a regular basis. I also see have a therapist and I have a psychiatrist. Um, so the way I do it is, I go to my therapist for the actual clinical diagnosis. You know what's going on with me in the you know chemicals in my brain. You know to get the uh, cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy I need to do. When I need spiritual guidance, while I'm doing that work, I still need spiritual guidance just about my everyday life. And I go talk to Pastor Hosea about, well, you know, I talked to my therapist about this, but, you know, I'm still not getting to the, and then he could point me to scriptures that can help reinforce those ideas yeah. and, um, and, you know, help work on those certain issues that I need or just to get a good hug and, you know, 
mm-hmm. um, with a different perspective from what you know God says, and then I can put them both together. And I need it all. Right. I, mean, but I have a yoga therapist. Right. <laughs> I have to be a meditator. <laughs> it's not just a one fix all. Every certain every person yeah. is different. And just to go back to you know really mental health. I think just learning how to, we have to learn what our emotions are yeah, and what we're feeling at a specific time. Because if you don't learn that, you don't know when you're actually struggling mentally. Um, so I wonder, Kim, if you can give us some signs of what depression looks like, what anxiety looks like, what are some things that we can look out for in ourselves or in our kids or in our family members to let us know that Oh, maybe we need to have a conversation about how somebody's feeling. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer that question. Uh, that one, and then also with the pastoral, how to determine the pastoral and when to go to therapy. Just really quickly, I always kind of explain it to people, like like you said, Cheryl, like when you're looking for spiritual guidance, even spiritual counseling, um, go to pastoral counseling. But if you are running into barriers to apply what the, what they're giving or the guidance that they're giving, is usually there's a trauma trauma usually connected to that. Usually sometimes it's a a trauma response or things like that. It's something that that behavior is serving in that person's life that the benefits outweigh outweigh the cost of whatever that behavior is maybe, however it's negatively impacting their life. So I I just wanted to add on to that. Did I explain that? Well. So yeah, we just help with how to how to apply the word. So you get the get the word from the pastor, the council, and then the therapy. If there's barriers to living that out, exploring what that could be, because there could be some like trauma, mental health things related to stopping that person from mm-hmm. doing that. Um, but we talk about signs, and when we talk about signs, depression and anxiety, and that that is such a loaded question to be very honest, <laughs> because uh, signs look different from gender to gender. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes in male it, in males it could be irritation, uh, it could be anger, um, it can be um, Sadness, maybe, well, not necessarily in like a male look like how it's going to look in a female. So I always tell people like if you don't, if you can remember a time where you had joy, or like Cheryl, when you said I, I, I just, just felt like I'm existing, or I just felt like you know, blase, if there was a distinct memory time in your life where you had joy or you felt good or you felt pleasant and you are no, you don't feel that necessarily, that's a good indicator that there's been some type of switch or some type of something that has happened. Uh, because when I was in a place where I was experiencing depression, there wasn't any like clear, clear signs. It's just, I felt blase. I just felt like, yeah, no, indifferent. That was it. I felt indifferent. So it didn't show up in sadness. It didn't show up in crying. I just was kind of like had that apathy about everything. So general signs though, if you feel lethargic all the time, fatigue, uh, if you have low motivation to do things, uh, if you've, yeah, if you feel like you feel empty, you feel like you're just existing, you feel like kind of deep within yourself, like what's the point what's what's the purpose to to life even if some people they don't necessarily want to end their life but they feel like what's the point to life Um, anxiety can show up anxiety is very tricky one um typical signs are you know i feel like a lot of people experience anxiety more so physically uh they'll feel it in their their stomachs they'll feel tension feel those self cringe. Um, You know, of course, you see the typical signs of anxiety where you feel nervous or you feel fluttered. Um, But then we're also a lot more research is coming out uh, that there's undercurrent anxiety when we see people who have perfectionism, 
perfectionist uh, tendencies, uh, those types of things, when you go underneath the root of it, it's usually anxiety. It's a type of fear of failure. A lot of times we have a lot of different fears. It could be a fear of failure. It could be even self-sabotaging ourselves. It's connected to uh, anxiety. So anxiety can have a lot of different roots you know people who have panic attacks um people who have um experience like they'll have sweaty hands you know when they get in certain situations so um a lot of times it, it could look very different in a lot of people so i just say if you know of a time where you were feeling good what you identify as your best and you're no longer there usually you're into some, you're experiencing something, you know? Mm -hmm. And also too, um, I tell people that this is, you kind of have to take this one with a grain of salt, but if people who you trust, and I mean trust their advice, trust their love for you, if they're kind of feeling like, hey, you know what, you don't seem the same, or hey, you know what, you feel a little off, you know, trust that before you brush it off and be like, I don't care what people think, that's what your that's interpretation true kind of pray about it ask the lord ask right. the holy spirit like hey you know yeah. is there something uh to it also to um, the other thing just kind of split my mind but also too if you feel yourself like um there's a certain response to something and your response doesn't match it like you know maybe someone i don't know push you and then you get irate that's what i mean where maybe the situation is here and then you respond with the 10 or you respond with the nine or it just doesn't match that usually is a sign that there's some other, that's a, sometimes it's a trauma response something there that you need to process mm -hmm. and take it out um i think when you talk about how to have these conversations within our families and within our friends um i think being just being kind of the one that, that starts the conversation and you kind of hit on it earlier here where you said not coming from a place of condemning or coming from a right. place of, you know yeah you would because you got this issue or you know you got that mental ill you know mm -hmm. like having that critical spirit i always tell people like you know come from a place of when we're growing in our mental health, come from a place of curiosity and self-compassion. Like those two things have to be there when we we are healing and we are growing. Because uh, when you think about it, you know, who wants to be around someone who is condemning them or judging them or you could, you know, nobody. Yeah, nobody. So <laughs> we have to have that self-compassion and compassion for others uh, to create that warm and safe space. So it's about creating and inviting welcome space for someone to open up or to reveal. And then also what we're doing here through transparency. You know, yeah. I'm more likely to open up a little bit if I feel like you gonna hit me yeah. or you understand or you've been there already then I'm a little bit more likely to share my hurt and share my pain because of, you know, what you share. So yeah. things like that is having courage to be transparent, having courage to have those sensitive conversations through curiosity, compassion, and love. That's good. That's mm -hmm. good. How can we support friends with depression? Final question. I'm looking at the clock. How can we support friends with depression? Well, you know what? Uh, two uh, two things that I say, because I get that question. Um, I have mental health paid, so people DM me that question a lot. And one thing that I tell people is two things. One, ask the person. Oh. How, how, how would they like to be supported? <laughs> That's good. What, what I call, like your wife said, what I call support or what I need yeah. may need may be very different than maybe what Cheryl and what she's going through her space, what she may need. It may annoy the heck out of her if, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And, and I may enjoy it. So one, asking that person, asking that person, how, how can I support you in this? And then also too, if you, if you are, a, if they told you it was depression, also researching a little bit, getting a couple of things, just one, your own about it and getting an understanding because that will maybe help you in 
able to understand uh, your friend or your loved one better. That's good. That's good. Cheryl mentioned that. Oh, go ahead, Cheryl. Oh, no, I said one thing, um, especially as a professional, uh, people don't believe you. Huh. And I think the biggest way you can support your friend who says they have depression is to believe them. Don't say, no, you're just tired. No, everything will be all right tomorrow. Don't, you know, don't minimize what they're telling you. That's yeah. good. People, they look and they're like, well, nothing's wrong. Why are you depressed? You shouldn't be depressed. It's like, just accept it. Because nothing, nothing has to be wrong for me to be depressed. It could be the most beautiful, brightest day. Everything's going, I got paid today. And I will wake up and it's a no-go. It's just no go. So I think believe them is of the biggest step and show that in your conversations with them by not minimizing what they're going through, by not uh, complaining when they're in bed all day. Um, And, you know, like that question, how would you like to be supported? That's a game changer. And a lot of people like to, to um, I just want to pick back off what you said, Cheryl, because when you're, you have somebody that is depressed, you don't want to shove it under the rug and be like yeah. putting your problems on that person. Although we want people to talk, but right now it's about that person and we want to show them that attention. Some people like, to, for example, would be like, oh, yeah. You don't have to worry about that. You know, I went through this and da da da. What, <laughs> what you went through, right? And how you dealt with it is different. Right now, right. it's about that person. You said right. very important. Understand that person. Just right. sit there and listen and be there. Let them know that I'm here. Could yeah. you know? To, could help them a lot. Um, and I, you mentioned something, Miss um, Hollis. Something off the page right now. Sorry, I just don't want to forget it. You said something about trauma. You know, people yeah, that have yeah. like childhood trauma, trauma, a lot of people, when I used to think about trauma, I used to be like, oh, maybe they got raped or molested. But trauma could also be stuff that we see and experience, but it affects the way that we emotionally and the way we think. Like somebody could witness a gunshot. You could also witness somebody getting raped or hurt, something that you yourself, your psyche can't deal with. So trauma could be anything of the sort. Yeah. I just want to put that out there. Yeah, that's so good because um, I'm glad you said that because, yeah, usually when we think of trauma, we think of something super severe. Mm -hmm. But I always like to describe trauma as it's anything to you that was painful, that um, caused a disruption, Mm -hmm. that an unsuspected disruption. So that could be anything as into like you're a student there in class and their teacher embarrassed them. That right. can be traumatic right. for a kid and yeah. everybody laughs. Yeah. Yep. Because, yeah, because, and Cheryl true. mentioned that she was at work and, and you know, you know, he came in and he said, Oh, you know, because some people, you know, deal with stuff different. You have a whole workload. Like we also, we are encouraged um, to also seek counsel because we all take on a workload. And and, and so we need someone to talk to too. We need self-care just like anybody else. So, um, you know, all that stuff is important. Self-care, getting to know who you are um, as a person and, and dealing with all our issues so we could be able not to put that, transfer that onto yeah. other people. So all that stuff, um, I think, is very important. Hey, this is good. Oh. Excellent. What I want to do, because, listen, we got to bring this back every week. We got to do this every week. I'll see it. We got to do it every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, stay tuned. I'm going to tell you what time next week. But listen, I want everyone to weigh in on, like, your, your closing uh, points, the things that you definitely want to leave the people with as it relates to this conversation of mental health. Cheryl, I think you were going to say something, so I'll start with you. <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say, but as my closing point, I would just say, everybody has mental health. Right. Everybody's going to have mental health struggles. Everybody's going to have mental health issues because we, we go through life. And sometimes they're generational. Sometimes they're situational. Sometimes they're physical. And you have to be able to start to think about your mental health every day. And the biggest part of your mental health is your self-care. I went down mentally mostly because I spent a lot of time thinking about other people. Wow. And I have to 
that is my biggest challenge is to finally see myself as a priority. That means when I don't feel good, I tell people I don't feel good. When I'm tired, I actually take a nap. I am not a robot, I'm not a machine. And I'm telling myself this so I can know. And I'm not a super woman, because as black women, we are made to be black magic this and superheroes. Mm -hmm. You're not, you need to rest, you need to sleep, you need to pray, you need to meditate, you need to eat properly, you need to walk, you need to know how you feel. I don't even know when I'm sad. Wow. So it's because I, I'm so busy taking care of other people, whether it's my clients, helping with my family, wow. just being a friend. I extend myself to the point where I don't know myself. Wow. I'm not to take care of myself. I can accomplish goals all day, but can you stop and make sure that you ate a proper meal today? Wow. Can you stop and make sure that you actually slept for six to eight hours? That's good. Do you know if you're actually happy today? Or are you just working wow. and just surviving? Wow. So my goal for 2021 is to live, not survive. <laughs> yeah. right. I love it. Woo -hoo. Yes. Yes. Mrs. Hollis. But that that was just the meat potato. <laughs> I, I my my number one is vision and passion is life. What I what I encourage believers is with our minds we serve the Lord. And that's why mental health is important because in order to serve God, you know, we gotta be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so that's that's why we're doing this discussion today. Amen. I love that you guys touch sure. on that because I, I love cognitive um mm -hmm. because it has to do with your mind. Let's be more aware of what we're thinking, what we spend in our minds on, because whatever you're thinking is how you're going to react or behave throughout the day. If you're stressing about or thinking about um, a certain, you know, that's the way that, you know, your life is going to show it. So try to, to on purpose or put effort into like doing something that is positive, write down all the positive things that you love to do, enjoy to do, mm -hmm. and, and try to pick something out. I know it's pandemic and everything, but try to, find certain things that you could do at home, play games, look at a movie with family, something to distract all that negativity because it's it will come, but it's how you handle it. In the words of my late mm -hmm. great mentor, brother Robert McHenry, he would say, son, your lifestyle would never rise above the level of your mentality. Wow, that's good. God talked about our thought process as much as he talked about anything. At this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Think on these thoughts. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely. Set your mind on things above, not below. He and he that keeps his mind stayed on me. I keep him in perfect peace. God talked about our mental state. Okay. As he talked about anything. We cannot neglect it. Yeah. It so has to be priority. One thing. I forgot to mention words are powerful. Oh yeah. Miss Cheryl mentioned about uh, yes. about the um positive words are inspiration. Words are so powerful. The thoughts gonna come, but don't let it come through your mouth because it comes out and it develops and and so we have to be aware of our thoughts, also our words. Yeah, yeah. Words words are containers for your thoughts. Yeah. Words okay. you see goes out and comes in. Hey, I'll close on this exercise. It just mm -hmm. you remind me when you said that, Sugar. I want to close on this exercise, y'all. So everybody do this exercise with me okay. really quick. My mentor used to teach me this. Because, you know, sometimes your mind is going crazy, mm -hmm. right? And you don't want to think that way. You're like, oh, my God, I'm trying to stop thinking this way. And it's like it's overwhelming to you. Here's mm -hmm. what my mentor used to teach me. Here's the exercise. Now, I want you to do everything that I say, though. You ready? Okay. When I snap my fingers... I'm going to have you to count from one to 10 in your mind, okay. in your mind, but you got to do everything I say. Okay. All right. Okay. Ready? Count. Wow. Now say, thank you, Jesus. Say, Lord, I love you. Say, Lord, say it. Lord, I you say no, it. no, say okay. it. Lord, Lord, I love you. Oh, Lord, Lord, I love you. God is good. God is good. God is good. Watch this. Your mind stopped counting. Because your mind has to stop wow. thinking and listen to what your mouth is saying. <laughs> when your mind is out of control, use your words to put it back in check wow. by proclaiming out of your mouth the goodness of God. That's good. Thank you. Thank this you has been wonderful. Yes. We are coming back next Saturday. Yes.
I will stay tuned on Facebook and our Instagram because I will create a flyer with the time. I just don't know what time yet, yeah. but I will by Monday yeah. posting a flyer with the time. I'll see you in the morning, 8 a, at 6 a.m. for our prayer, 8 a.m. for our morning devotional, and we're going from there. Thank you so much, Miss um, Bailey, because I know it took guts for you to yeah. share your experience. Yeah, it's not yeah. your experience is not for you only. It's for other people who are listening. Yeah. And thank you, Miss Hollis, so much for, for your inspiration. I'm learning still. That's why I listen a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Man. Y'all give it up. Oh! <laughs> All right, y'all. To the next time. That's it. Yeah. See you soon. God bless you.